Strange things are afoot at the Circle K. That kid is back on the escalator again. And don't hurt. Is my boomstick. Game over, man. Game over. Welcome to the Bargain Bin. He is your host, Ben Mason. And he is your co-host, Sandra Luketic. And today we're talking Sandra's newest favorite movie, 2006's The Wicker Man. Why would you do that to me, man? We assume if you're listening to this episode, you've already seen the movie. Can I stress something right now? Sure. Really watch this movie before listening to this episode if you want to watch this movie. <laughs> I'm not saying watch the movie, but if you have any sort of inkling, honestly, the the intrigue, the mystery of what's going on in it is perhaps the only good thing. And I don't want to deprive you of that. <laughs> if you have to watch this movie, I don't recommend it. I'll say it right now. Right, out of, We're not going to get to the end. I'll say it right now. I don't recommend this movie. But if you are that kind of glutton for punishment or you are just curious, watch it. Don't take away the mystery from yourself. It's the only reason to watch it. <laughs> Really, all, all I can add to that is if you if you absolutely have to watch The Wicker Man, watch the 1973 original. Yeah, you know, I think it would have been valuable to me to have watched the original. <laughs> to compare, no, because honestly, like, uh, like I was looking up this movie, and part of it was done as a love letter to the original. Because, and it, you know, at the end, it's uh, dedicated to uh, one of the Ramones. Johnny. Johnny Ramone. Because he introduced the original, and they just love the movie, and they wanted to do it. And it's like, now I'm curious, like, how much of a disservice did they actually do? It's like... And that's it, man. It'd be like, if he was alive, he'd be like, don't put my name on that. Yeah. <laughs> like, no. Don't, don't put my name on that. No, of course not. And the thing is, too, like, saying that this movie is a labor of love is like... Seeing a movie that becomes your all-time favorite and you have the abilities to remake it and your immediate thought is, how can I fuck this up the worst way possible? Because that's what I'm going to do. Okay, I have a feeling I'm going to take the reins of this episode a lot. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Well, we should also say that this is the second time that we've recorded in person. And nobody cares about that. Yeah, I know. But that's also my excuse for not having my usual notes done. Uh, I, I'm going to be honest with you, even without your usual notes, I have a feeling I'm going to take over so, more than usual. So we're, we are going to use the uh, Wikipedia plot synopsis today. Uh, no, you're not going to just test my memory and see how much of it I can remember? Well, this leaves out a lot. So right. yes, I will. Okay. So we open the movie and there's essentially like a credits crawl. I don't think we need to talk about that. No. But... The one thing I noticed is, like, the font is even a direct copy of the original. It is, yeah. And it's a nice nod. Again, makes you think that, like, well, they're really going to do this movie some justice. And they're going to treat the source material with some tender love and care. And th that's not what happens here. So we see this diner waitress. Don't get familiar with her, because this is her only scene. Who is serving Aaron Eckhart. Eckhart, who don't get comfort comfortable with him, because this is all you're going to see of him, to then treat, I guess, like kind of almost flirty-like? Yeah. The police officer that's at the counter. Don't get used to him, because you only see him like once more after this. Mm -hmm. This scene is just bad. It's also pointless. It's so pointless. There's a common occurrence. <laughs> um... I the waitress is kind of cute. Yeah. Can't act. Aaron, uh, I can never pronounce Eckhart? his last name. Eckhart, good actor, does nothing in his cameo. Absolutely nothing. All of this is to set up the introduction to our protagonist, who, like, after she deals with the other customers, kind of pipes up, like, hey, or, you know, like, your salad order is ready or whatever. She's just like, calling to him. And here we have our hero, Nicholas Cage valiantly turned towards the camera from his rack of novels and self-help books. It's a strong character. He's a motorcycle police officer who the first thing we see is shopping for self 
self-help books. I don't have a problem with self-help books. I don't have a problem with people needing help. This is your intro to the character. And he has the goofiest smile on his face when he finds the audio book that's like, you know, everything is all right or everything is fine. Is it because it's audio and he can't read? Like, why is he so stupidly giddy at seeing this? I don't know. Uh, there's a lot about this movie. I don't know. Look, there's going to be so many times where I break the order of this movie because obviously what happens at the end plays back to a lot of the beginning. A lot of theories about this movie, how pretty much all of the events that take place after the next coming scene is potentially him losing his grip on sanity, kind of going insane. Why is he already buying a self-help book? Or is he smiling because he's mocking the idea of needing a self-help book just so that, ironically, in a minute, we see a character who really needs a self-help book? See, I think he's already depressed because of the collapse of his relationship years prior. Years prior! Get over it, man! Sometimes it's not that easy. Yeah, and we'll even get to it because, okay, there's a theatrical cut and an unrated cut. We'll, we'll bring up the difference between the two. But in one of the theatrical, is it, yeah, the theatrical cut, you see that, like, the relationships that are supposed to be created are not long term. No. But somehow his was because he had gotten as far as being engaged. But it really feels like they were just supposed to get knocked up. Yeah, definitely. There's no, no connection. In any of this movie, and keep in mind, nothing we've discussed yet has any bearing on the movie overall. No. So then we get to a montage of him doing his motorcycle cop things. Giving a ticket to a guy, riding up a car that's parked on the side of the road. He's a real man's man motorcycle cop guy. And in probably, like, the sweetest cinematic scene, a little girl throws a doll out the back window of her car. And as he drives by, he doesn't stop. He just leans his bike over far enough to pick up the doll without breaking stride and turn on the sirens to be saving the day because this girl needed her doll back. Risking his life, might I add. Risking his life. Unnecessarily. I'm trying to doll. add as much excitement to this Gravitas. movie. Gravitas. Don't. Because keep in mind that what I just described is not interesting or exciting as it happens in the movie at all. Yeah, but it does lead into the next scene, which we revisit maybe five times, which also is pointless. And none of the revisits like, oh, as I see them, I gain more clarity and see how it's attached to the movie. It is not. It's not. It's, it's not, not at all. I mean, there's a theory that it is, because... It's supposed to contribute to his fragile state that would make him want to venture out for the rest of the movie. But, like, I'll talk about this at the end. There are so many things that happen in this movie that when you know the ultimate plot of the people on the island, work almost in complete counter to yeah. what their objective is. And I do have to say, I believe, I personally believe that the reason why there are so many fan theories out there is because someone's trying to make sense of the movie. Well, I'll tell you who wasn't trying to make sense of the movie is the writer of the movie. Yeah. So anyway, okay, so he pulls over the car. And in it, we see a mother and her daughter. Daughter, this becomes very uh, iconic for just imagery, is wearing a red sweater, pigtailed blonde hair. Yes. Okay. Mother, also blonde. Also blonde, yeah. A little bit more unassuming than the girl. Like, the girl... I don't know if they did it on purpose, but, like, they're in a car made to look like they're moving, mm -hmm. right? There's boxes and stuff. So, I don't know if it was intentionally done with the car. A lot of the stuff is very drab color, boxes, things like that. Yep. So, that, like, the red and the blonde of the daughter really stand out. It punches out from, like, uh, like an like, imagery standpoint. Whereas the mother is a little bit more subdued, just from that standpoint. Yeah. And Nicolas Cage, you know, being a very nice guy and a cop, is just trying to give the doll back. And this little girl is just a jerk. She also looks like she would be the kid from The Omen. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. She, little bit, she, little bit she looks bit. crazy her, demonic. He hands her the doll back, and what does she do? Throws it out the window again. Immediately pitches it out of the car again. And, like... He goes to pick it up. Well, we should say, too, leading up to this, 
there are just massive freight trucks flying down this highway. No one's caring about the fact that there's a policeman on the road. Mm -mm. They're just completely disregarding the speed limit. So well, he, we don't know what the speed limit is. It it, it does seem to not, be a highway, a two lane along the coast. It, I don't know. Okay, but I think you're reading a little too much into it. I'm reading too much yeah. into it. Okay. Hey, I haven't said anything yet that wasn't legitimately in it. Okay. I might have. I might have made it a little bit more grandiose, but I haven't. Oh yeah, maybe. I haven't inferred yeah, anything maybe. yet. Yet. You're giving way okay, way gonna, too much energy. Oh, don't don't worry. It's gonna happen. I am going to make a lot of stretches. <laughs> okay, so what happens when she throws the... Oh, the you're going to take over the... No, I'm asking drink? you what happens when she throws the doll back into the road again. Okay, so this... Here we go. All right, this is probably, like, the peak of the movie, because it's downhill from here. Nicolas Cage goes to go pick it up. Because mm -hmm. we're setting up. He's a nice guy. We get a nice side shot of the car, so we don't see any of the road ahead or in front. It's literally the camera is looking at Nicolas Cage with the car in the background. He strolls towards the doll, goes to pick it up, and then BAM! <laughs> freight truck just barrels through the car in the background. <laughs> and I do have to say, I said it when we watched it, that was Nicolas Cage's fault. There's another recap of this where they actually do show... Uh, the, the side angle, like yeah. almost from his motorcycle that was parked behind the car. And you do see the truck. And it doesn't show it veering out of the way to get out of the way of Nicolas Cage. But the angle that they show it at really does imply that, like, yeah, he saw a dude in the road and swerved to the side. Yep. Question. Sure. Say you're speeding down the highway. Yes. And you see somebody directly in front of you in the road. Then you see a car on the left-hand side of the road, pulled over. Would you go to the right-hand side, where there is no car and no person, or would you veer to the left-hand side and hit a car head-on? Well, that's the thing. It depends. But it really does look like Nicolas Cage is clearly in his lane. So there is also a lane that is between them, because she's parked on the shoulder. There are, there are, there there are, are a lot of questions. There are options, is the main idea. So anyway, the car is on the side of the road. It's just been hit by a freighter truck. Yep. And it's on fire. Because things in movies set on fire, regardless. Of course. Like, no, we just drove by a car accident. There was no fire. There was no fire. And, like, those cars were demolished. But we see the little girl sitting in the back seat, and Nicolas Cage wants to save her. Takes off his helmet to smash the the, the window out of the back. Well, it makes sense or yeah. whatever. And she makes no attempt to get out of the car. No. She doesn't reach for him. She doesn't show any signs of concern that she's in a car that was just hit and on fire. We don't see the mom, so presumably, like, yeah. oh, she's dead. But the kid's fine. But and the just kid's fine. Staring Someone at him. Not even a scratch getting hit by an 18-wheeler. Yeah. Even if she is in the back, there would have been some crumpling. And the car explodes. Nicolas Cage miraculously dives out of the way. Or he second. gets thrown out of the way. No, no, no. He dives. No, no. It, he miraculously dives seconds after the explosion takes yeah. place. And then we cut out of the scene. That's the last we see of that right now. So he survives without a scratch. But obviously it's meant to set up like a weakened emotional state. Because he's a police officer he was trying to save a little girl. He's already dealing with issues, he's supposedly. He's already dealing with issues. And he's at home now. I don't know. Is it implied that he's, like, on leave? Yeah. Yeah, like, okay. Because he does go to the police station later, and they're like, oh, you're back? Yeah, okay. So he's on mental leave. I don't know. It's, like, three months later, is it? I think so, yeah. It's three months later. He's sitting at his home in his track suit, just sitting there, when a fellow police officer shows up to his place to give him some letters. Yeah. And one of them is a letter that she, spoiler, clearly tucked in there. Oh, yeah. That was unmarked, no stamp, but was sent to him. Why don't you take over here a little bit? First thing is, there's no return address. Like you said, no stamp on the envelope. It's written on parchment paper of sorts, old parchment, in calligraphy, which should be your first sign that something weird's going on. And it's from his ex-fiancee, Willow. Willow Woodward, 
letting him know that she is okay, but that her daughter Rowan is missing. Before I continue, I just want to bring up the fact that, like I said earlier, we're going off of the Wikipedia plot. And we already said how certain things that are in the movie just don't need to be there. They're pointless. We don't need to talk. Well, not that we don't need to talk about them, but they add nothing to the movie. The very first line of the Wikipedia plot synopsis is policeman Edward Malice gets news from his ex fiance Willow Woodward, that her daughter Rowan is missing. Wow. We've talked quite a bit of what's happened thus far. That is has no impact on the plot I whatsoever. like how the police officer... The female cop that showed yeah. up to give him the letter, presumably to check on him too, to like, how are you doing, whatever. And they just sit there awkwardly silent for a few seconds. And he's like, I don't need company. And it's like... Doesn't she also like look at his prescription pill bottles? I don't know. And like through his other mail? I don't know. It just seems weird. But, like, there's just an awkward sitting on the couch for a minute with each other. Yeah, it's a please leave moment. Yeah. And she's like, I'm getting a paycheck for this. (laughs) And then he goes back to the police station. To get some information. Yes. Because he's told that that letter was just dropped off at the the police station. Yeah. Right? Which makes the most sense if there was no stamp that it was hand-delivered. You know, obviously it makes sense to investigate. Maybe somebody did receive that letter. Yeah. And, oh, well, who was the person that dropped it off? What did they look like? He doesn't end up getting any of that information. No. Before he goes to the police station, though, he does look up um, the the island that she's from. As he Summer's said. Isle. Summer's Isle. Because she says in the letter, I went back home. Yeah, it's an island off the coast of the Pacific the Northwest. Yes. And he looks it up because they have a website for, I guess, for selling their bee honey. Yeah. Which, that brings up a whole host of problems. <laughs> that they have a website. Yeah. Because they don't have any other Later technology. on, there's, a, there's a, a community that has no phones. How do they have a website? Who made this website? Connection Who to the mainland. It? There is no connection. Even if there's a connection to the mainland, if this website is to place orders for the honey, who's receiving these orders? They're being flown by the guy with the seaplane. Yeah, but somebody has to get the orders. Exactly. It's their connection. Anyway, so anyway, he goes to see his buddy. Keep, keep in mind... This is the guy from the diner. This is also the last scene he's in. Yep. <laughs> and I love it, too, where he goes for information, and the guy's like, oh, you're, you're back? He's like, no. And then the, his friend's immediate reaction is kind of like, well, okay, I've got police things to do. Yeah. Pl- please leave. <laughs> Go away. <laughs> Great friend. But he decides that he is going to go look for his ex fiance's daughter. Yeah, and I mean, he talks to his police friend about it, and this is where we get a little bit more information, because the police friend even asks, like, well, because in the letter, it says, like, my daughter's missing. The guy's like, well, why don't you try calling, tracking the dad down? Yeah. Right? And he's like, well, I tried calling, but the island doesn't have phone service. So how did you try calling? What number did you call? What number did you call? Did you just pick up the phone and say... Summer's Isle, please? (laughs) Like, okay, whatever. It doesn't make sense how it happened, but the idea is this island doesn't have phone service. So he decides that, well, there's no communication. There's no phone. I guess the only way to look into this is to go to the island. Which is illegal if he's doing actual police work while on leave in the first place, let alone police work out of his jurisdiction. Yeah. In a completely different state. See, I can understand if he just goes to look. But he, he flashes that badge around. He flashes the badge. He brings the gun. If he just went to go investigate, well, that's not technically police work. No. He's just looking for a lost child, right? But how does he get to the island? <sighs> this really irritates me. The, uh, he... First he starts with a fairy. Yes. Well, we're led to believe that... Because it looks like a diner or something he's sitting in, but I'm... That's on the ferry, right? Like... Yes. Well, he's, like, walking around inside the ferry. A lot of ferries have a little, like, cafe area. Yeah, okay. Fair um, has another vision of a girl, a little girl outside leaning on the railing, looking out at the water. Wearing a red wearing sweater. Wearing a red sweater. With blonde pigtails. And then out of nowhere, as he's walking towards her, BAM! Another <laughs> truck 
flies down the outside of the ferry and kills her. Oh, man. You'd think that trucks would have their own ferry or something. Like, what are you doing on this one? Uh, way to pick up speed that fast, too. Oh, jeez. Um, and and then, it's just a vision. Yeah. Another vision. Is it a... Is it his weakening mental state? Well, we don't know. We'll never know. It doesn't tell. I, I, something else it, it doesn't tell us is where is he going on the ferry if he doesn't know how to get to the island? Is he just going? Well, he knows how to. He knows where the island is geographically. He just can't call it. Yeah, but he doesn't even know how to get to it. So he's just taking the ferry to, I guess, a different island. I would imagine that he's looking at like. The coast closest to where the island would be. I mean, that has to make yeah. sense to me. But then... He, he is a police officer. There's got to be something that he does know how to do. Oh, really? Because that's like, not in this not movie. Not in the movie, no. Not in this movie at all. <laughs> Alright, so <laughs> he eventually finds this old guy loading a seaplane. And he's asking, do you know where Summer's Isle is? And I was like, yeah. It's like, uh, he does the supply runs out there. In fact, that's what he's doing right now. He's like, oh, well, could you give me a a lift? He's like, no, it's a private island. They want to keep it that way. He's like, well, what about, uh, I forget the two names. Um, My friend Grant and his his twin brothers Ulysses or something like that. And the guy's like, after making a very steadfast point, I'm not taking you. They don't want visitors. No, I'm not going to do this. He gives him like a hundred bucks and he's like, yeah, let's go. Imagine that's where the movie ended. Well, no. No, I can't get to the <laughs> island, I guess. Yeah. Oh, and Nicholas Sorry, Cage, Willow. Nicholas Cage just says, Well, come on, give me a flight. It's only a few miles. I could swing there. Swim there. And the pilot says, Better start swimming then. Yeah. Because before he hadn't offered him the hundred dollars yet. And it's like, imagine that the movie starts with like this guy's like, no. And you see Nicholas Cage just with like a rowboat. <laughs> 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 Honestly, it would make as much sense as the rest of the movie, man. It's just, the pacing is absolutely ridiculous. Um, Well, the guy does say he's not going to take him all the way to the island. He'll leave him at, like, the coastline. Yeah. And he can walk the rest of the way. Which he doesn't. Because he doesn't want, yeah, no. He He takes him right right to the the dock. (laughs) Yeah, he's walking up the coastline at the pier. The best, the best part about that, though, is you don't see him get off the plane. You just see him, like, hiking and huffing and puffing up a hill and, like, branches are in his face and then it cuts to a wider shot and he's just on a trail from the dock up and there's just a tree in the distance why are you so tired he's exhausted absolutely exhausted Whew. we're about what 15 minutes into the movie not even no, <laughs> no. <laughs> so here comes another fantastic scene he is met by some of the locals uh two or three females it's three yeah and two males carrying a sack with something writhing in the sack. And it's a big sack. It's taking both guys, like, they're putting effort into holding it off the ground. And they question who he is, what he's doing there. Because obviously they don't want visitors. He's trying to be nice. He is trying, he's trying to be, to be nice. friendly. He's just like, you know, I was I was called to look for a missing person. Holds up the picture. You know, and he's friendly. And he does have a good line here. Where one of them's like, oh, never seen her before. He's like, just a bit of a tip. Helps to look at the picture. Yeah. Right? Because this lady is not making eye contact. Just looking off to the side. She's like, never seen her. Yeah. All right. So he's getting nowhere in this conversation. So he finally decides to ask the question that probably anybody would have asked immediately. Maybe not in the same way he asks it. So what's in the bag? Like a a shark shark or something? And nobody answers. They just kind of grin like a bunch of idiots. And that doesn't raise... Okay, this gotta be like police officer avoid every red flag ever known to man. Oh, he's just not paying attention. Because he just accepts it. He's, he's like, like All right. it even shows on... Like, it cuts to a closer camera angle that shows, like, the bag is, like, bleeding he out even, of the bottom. He even points out, he's like, your, uh, your sack is leaking. And he just doesn't press up. And they even say, why don't you take a look inside? And then... I don't know if it's meant to be like the guys flick the bag. But yeah, like they do. Shit, and he just says, "Oh, forget that." It'd be like, now I definitely want to look. Yeah, my my main problem with that. You know scene, what? The, my main problem with that scene is, you think you're gonna know what's in that bag? Because you never do. No, it never comes up again. There's nothing even hinted at later in the movie to suggest 
that you know what is in that sack. But also, my biggest problem with the scene is if you're going to a mysterious island that has really no contact with the outside world, you know they're hostile towards visitors. Don't be sarcastic as soon as you start talking to the first people you see. It's not a good image for you. Or the complete opposite. Just show up guns a-blazing. <laughs> Can you imagine? Just literally, literally guns a-blazing. <laughs> <laughs> just, he just walks up to the lady, she gives him a smart ass remark, and he just shoots her in the head. Anybody else got any comments? <laughs> now, have any of you seen this girl? <laughs> I bet you'll be looking at Probably. the picture now. They're like, hey, what's in that sack? Because if you don't answer, you're going to be <laughs> This movie already got better. Yeah. So anyway, he just walks away. He accepts the fact that they didn't tell him what's in the sack, and heads to what could be only described as a tavern. Why? Why does it why is it tavern there? There this community does not have visitors, does not accept people. Doesn't really have like a a financial system of any sort that we we're aware of. And you know what? That's fine if the idea is that like think of like more like a summer camp like rec hall. Yeah. This is like a communal dining area, but it is set up like a tavern. And I can accept that. Even that. It's like fine, okay. You yeah. went and off. You want to make a place that feels like a tavern just to create a bit of a social feeling, even if you, like, we don't have currency to exchange. But yeah, this is a place to go have some drinks and sit around tables and chat yeah. and whatever. They have an extra room upstairs. Yep. I, Why? For guests. Why? Guests that they don't want at the island. I mean, it does make sense after seeing the film. That they need at least one. Yeah, but it, you think they'd have a better way of, like, explaining it? Like, you know, one of our community went to the mainland, their room is available right now, sure, you can stay there. But they don't make it sound like they leave for the mainland. Yeah, I know. It just, it's it's a massive plot hole. So anyway, he's he's he comes into this tavern, we got a little sidetrack there, and <laughs> there. He, he talks to, I guess, the... Barkeeper? Yeah, Sister Beach. Sister Beach. I love Sister Beach. Did she you is... not hear it when they said it? Sister Beach. Yeah. She has such a harsh attitude. And it's yeah. perfect. Yeah. Anyway, so he asks her, you know, are you like uh, the equivalent of a bar matron, bar, bar keeper, staff, bar staff, whatever? And she just pours him a mead. And tells him that it's like honey and herbs, herbs, and he just drinks it. I mean, I've done that before. I was already drunk, but I mean, people have just poured me a drink. And you like, just yeah, right. saw a writhing, writhing, bleeding bag outside from a bunch of creepy, like, psychos that don't leave the island. I ain't drinking that. Yeah. No. But they do, like, as hostile as they are, they do. And he drinks it and slams the cup down on a bee. That does not go over well. And you know what? If you look at it again, this is one of those meads, yep. like mead cups, where there's it's clearly... It's a stein with the glass bottom that's raised. It's raised. That bee wouldn't have died. No. It would just be trapped in there. I think they actually used a bee in that scene, and that's how they could get away with it without actually killing it. Fair, but then don't show us the bottom of the meat glass. Yeah, you know what else they shouldn't show us? The broken glass from the picture that he finds. Well, we haven't gotten there. You're jumping way ahead. That's not way ahead. Can we stay on court? No, it's way ahead. Oh, okay. It is. Oh, all right. Oh, yeah, it is. You're right. Yeah. Just in the same... It's the same... It's in the same establishment, but it's not now. At which point, apparently this mead gave him, like, big confidence. Because he just starts slapping the counter with his badge. Yep. Getting everyone, hey, everyone, give me your attention. I'm a police officer. Like, you are, let, let's yeah. just say that lay, this, lay low, man. Let, let's just say that this isn't a, a island of psychotics. Maybe be a little bit more tactful. Even if they are just completely normal, you know, like isolated, Amish, you know, just kind of, they're living their own world. They don't have communications or whatever. Even electricity doesn't seem to be super prevalent or anything like that. No, mainly candlelight. Yeah. That's going to scare them away. Right? Like, yeah. maybe try to be a little bit more tactful. It doesn't matter. At this point, Willow, who 
is his former fiance, fiance yeah. has been preparing his room, and she slips him a letter that essentially says, meet me out in this spot by, like, it's like, how does he know where this spot is? I don't know. It, like, he reads it, and I don't remember the exact wording, but it's like, there's a opening by these trees, and it's like, how does he know where that is? This movie expects us to just fill in a lot of holes ourselves. So he goes to meet her. And, spoiler, worst character nominee, Willow, has her first conversation with him. This character, I'd have to go back and look at it, finishes no sentences. No. The director essentially told Kate Behan or whatever her name, I'm not sure how it's pronounced, Behan? Behan, yeah. When you play Willow, just read the first half of every sentence and trail off and stare off into nowhere. Yeah, look as confused as possible every time you and open your mouth. And they make her look high as shit every time she's... Even the first time we saw her, because we watched the movie together, I said, like, why are her eyes so red? Well, there were four of us watching it, and we all pretty much made the same comment at that time. So <laughs> she goes on to say how, like, her daughter's been missing. No informa- No new information from what we got in the letter. Right? Mm-hmm. This this specific conversation adds nothing to it. Later on, she gives a little bit more in oddly timed intervals where it's like, this information would have been handy from the start. Because what's the first thing you might do with a missing person's case? Look in the last place you saw them. Mm-hmm. They don't do that for a very long time. No. This conversation provides... No new details. She essentially says that she was sorry that she left. She had to come home. She's sorry she did. And that her daughter is now missing. (laughs) All right. So the new info we got is, I'm sorry I left. I shouldn't have. I shouldn't have. But I came home. Now, you have to put that together because she won't say the whole sentence herself. No. You know, I was trying to go along with this in in the uh, Wikipedia uh, plot synopsis, but they ended up rearranging the entire story to make it make sense. So oh, okay. Can't even really follow no, along I do with it. it. No, you're right on. This is like the most I've spoken in an episode ever. Uh, in, in this here, three sentences in, we're talking about Ellen Burstyn, who we don't see until like at least halfway through the movie. All right, then. Yeah. Why don't you take over for a scene or two? Because I'm fucking confused as to where we are right now. What do you mean? I don't remember what happens next after, uh, after that. Cause like immediately my thought is to jump to the, uh, the encounter at the schoolhouse. Oh no, no, there's still, a whole that's what I'm before saying though. Before the encounter at the schoolhouse, he is sleeping. Cause I guess he's decided that there's no need to do any further exploration or investigation on this day. Make sure you've got those EpiPens though. It does show the EpiPens, however, they already hint that he's allergic to bees when he slams the stein down. Yep. We didn't mention it at that time, but he flat out, his defense, when he sees that she is aghast by that, is, oh, sorry, I'm allergic. Nope. Not even sorry, I think he just goes, I'm allergic. Yeah, I don't think it matters. No. It does But it's just, a, it's more so him just giving attitude. So he goes to sleep. It's the most obvious thing you would do now. Of course. Although, to be fair... We don't know what time of the day he finally got there. He's been traveling to get the island. Like, the sun might have been setting just as he was finishing his conversation with Willow type thing. I don't know. I'd still be questioning. Of course. (laughs) I'd still be questioning as many people that I encounter. But if you were questioning them and not going right to the scene of him sleeping, you wouldn't get the next flashback of a kid getting hit by a truck. And I think this is the one that has the angle from his motorcycle where that's the only new information we get because they show this scene or at least a girl getting hit by a truck so many times but give us no further information yeah this one it just almost looks like yeah maybe it was his fault and this could be playing up to perhaps the guilt maybe we didn't like maybe the intention was we didn't see it but he feels more guilty that he couldn't save them yeah oh because he realizes it 
oh man, if I wasn't grabbing that, I wouldn't have gotten in the way of the truck. Like, it's even more my fault that this car was hit. Because the first thing he does when he wakes up from this vision is grab his medication. Yeah. Right? I guess it's not on a time dinner no, bowl. No, like, no, no. You just take, take, take you it need. when you want it. Yeah, just take when you want. And by doing the act of looking, or by getting the medicine, he looks out the window. It is nighttime now. The most well-lit forest you'll ever see in the middle of the night. But he sees a little girl in a red sweater with blonde pigtails running into the forest. Yep. And because there hasn't been enough action, all we've had is him picking up a doll and then three trucks hitting three little girls. You have to add a nothing scene to put in a little bit of action because he follows her essentially into like a barn. Was it like a barn? I'm not sure. I don't remember a barn. He built, he follows her into some sort of building. I don't remember that scene at all. Oh, jeez. So he sees the little girl out the window. Yeah. Into the forest. Yeah, I remember he that. He follows after with a flashlight. Yes. He goes into some building. I would have swore it was like a barn. It even does one of those like jump scare type things where you see from a distance the door and he comes in and then what's supposed to be the little girl like whooshes in front of the camera, which was like the upstairs part of the barn. And then the floor gives out. He's hanging. Oh, that's right. Yes. I do remember him hanging there. And, like, he's hanging because he goes to, like, investigate. He climbs to the top floor where the girl whooshed by the camera screen, right? And because you have no action, you have to add nothing action. And, like, just a floor panel gives out. And he's hanging above, like, pitchforks and other tools that are just there that would have, like, impaled him if he fell. <laughs> I don't I don't know, man. This this whole movie's a jumbled mess in my brain. Now here's the beautiful part. It just cuts from there. He climbs him his way up. It doesn't show him go back. It doesn't show him continue looking for the little girl. Just that scene's over now. Fine. That's how you added some more action to the movie. Just a random scene of him breaking through the floorboards in a barn and almost dying, which would completely negate the plot of this entire movie. <laughs> All right, so now it's the next day <laughs> because why not? Let's get the story going. Let's get the story going. I think we did miss a scene. I, I do apologize. After he talks to Willow. No, don't apologize to me. Uh, after he talks to Willow before he goes to sleep, he does go to his room, and this is where we see the EpiPens. We did refer reference to this, mm -hmm. but he can't find his self-help books. Oh, that's right. So he goes out into the hallway, and this is where we meet uh, Lily Sobieski's character, Sister Honey. Yep. Just carrying a basket of apples. And he says, like, did somebody unpack my bags? Because I'm missing a few things. And she's like, oh, what are you missing? Oh, the, you know, like these self-help books. They're called Everything's Fine. And she's just like, good. <laughs> and then eats the apple and walks away. She is one of the weirdest characters in the movie. And then it goes to him sleeping. I only wanted to mention it because that was the introduction of Lily Sobieski. And the next scene has her in it. And I didn't want to just skip over her introduction. So after his harrowing escape from the farm <laughs> of death, he's just sitting in, I, well, I don't know what you would call it, the tavern? Yeah. Having tea, I guess? And he tries to get some honey. Nope. But there's, like, no honey because you leave empty jars on the table. And he asks Lily so Sobieski's character for some honey. And she just gives him weird answers the entire time. But the information that we can glean from it is that they had a bad honey harvest the previous year. And that's why they're low on it. But she might be able to find him some sugar. It's at this time when she leaves the room that he notices an entire wall covered in portraits of little girls, like standing in presentation in like the most cult-like way. That somehow he didn't see this wall. All of whom? All of the other times he was in there. All of whom blonde pigtails? The other thing was before he talked to Lily Sobieski's character, Sister Honey, about the self-help book. He does look down the railing, because I guess the room he's staying in is upstairs. Yep. And, like, townsfolks are gathering, and you see these, like, creepy blind twin sisters 
saying how he is going to return. And they're all looking really creepy-like. And he just, again, ignoring all red flags, <laughs> just asks Sister Honey yeah. about his self-help books. Yeah, it was like uh, the day of tomorrow or something. Yeah, he's going to return. This is so weird. And you're not questioning any of it. No. So anyway, he, he sees this wall of portraits. And he notices that they're all, like, little blonde girls. Yep. They're all dressed the same way, like, kind of like white gowns, flowers. And they're standing in, like, essentially what looks like the exact same backdrop. Like, a, uh, it's a very formulaic, cult-like, picture-taking process. But the most recent one is just a smashed frame with glass on the floor. Everywhere. Everywhere. And the picture missing. At this, this is when he sees Sister Beach again. And he asks her, <laughs> what happened to last year's photo? He knows it's last year's. It's the most recent one, but it's got to be last year. It has to be. And she says, it was broke yesterday. Which again doesn't raise any flags for him. No. You're looking for a missing girl. A wall <laughs> of pictures of little girls has the most recent one smashed. The day before, nobody even bothers cleaning the no, glass. Nope, just smash it, remove and, it. And he's just like, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. There's no reason to question this. Even He's a he, terrible, terrible policeman. When he gets to the bar, the first time he talks to Sister Beach, after walking up the pier from the, the airplane, talking to the three weird ladies and the two guys holding the sack, the second he walks in, Sister Beach is like, Oh, you must be that police officer from California. California. It's like, how do you know that? And why are you not questioning it? Yeah. Again, red flags. Pay attention to them, dude. It's terrible. So, Sister Beach gives some more cryptic answers about how they have to have, like, a festival of fertility and a festival for... Like, the Harvest and... The Harvest Festival's first, then the Fertility Festival. But she can't talk about the Fertility Festival. No, well, they, they take photos of uh, every Harvest Festival. The Fertility Festival, we don't take... We don't do recordings of that. Which is... There's another interesting part of that coming up very soon. Okay. Okay. So he then decides that he wants to find Willow again. But she's not anywhere to be seen... And he sees Sister uh, um, Honey outside chopping wood. Yes. So, not wanting to talk to Sister Beach, understandably so, because she's completely rude and speaking in tongues, apparently. He goes to talk to Sister Honey to ask where Willow is. A complete waste of time. Complete waste of time. And she says... I was talking about her acting career. Oh, sorry. No. All right. But the scene, too, yes. So, so... <laughs> Do you want to describe this conversation? <laughs> no, it's okay. it's the most robotic, nonsensical thing ever. She says, I am carrying this episode. Okay. So hey, you've got this down. I'll he, back you. We're switching roles. I'm co host today. For the record, I've seen this movie one time. I fell asleep twice during that viewing. I didn't even watch it a second time. I literally watched it the one time. So he asks Sister Honey, Where's the other girl that works here? <laughs> Where is she? He can't say, where's Sister Willow? Where's the other girl that works here? Yeah. Fine. Whatever. She says that she took the daily lunch up to the school. Well, where's the school? It's through through the, the forest. Through the forest on the other side of the trees. Through the forest is enough description for him. Fine. But then the most peculiar part of this already odd conversation happens. It's so weird. Where Sister Honey gets really close to him. Super close. Uncomfortably close. And just says, like, when you leave here, will you take me with you? And he just, like, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't even think he says no. He's no, he does like, he chuckles just, yep. and then walks He's got away. that weird Nicolas Cage smirk that which leads to, like, a slight glance of, like, discomfort. And just leaves. So, as he's walking through the forest to get to the school, he walks by four pregnant women. Mm-hmm. So. Very pregnant women. 
So the fertility festival happens after the harvest festival, which is just about to take place. But long pregnancies. Probably, yeah, yeah. Thirteen yep. month pregnancies, I guess. Yep. Makes no sense. Timeline wise, makes no sense. We should also mention too that of the few men we see on the island, none of them speak. Yeah, but we haven't seen too many yet. We've only seen the few carrying the sack and some playing cards or something in the uh, tavern. Yeah, but that tavern scene is after he comes back from the school. Oh, I thought so that was when even... he first got there. When he first gets it doesn't there, really it's kind matter. Of a mix of people, but it's a crowd. Yeah. There is a scene, and I think it's after the school, where he gets to the tavern, and it's just the men. Yeah. Almost like they are segregated to eat on their own type thing. Yes. So, okay. Can you do the school scene now? Not well. But I do love Molly Parker. Can you try? I've been talking this whole time. <laughs> yeah, I know. You're doing my role. Imagine doing that for 71 episodes. I feel like I'm doing more. I feel like you I always think more you're than doing you're more. interjecting. I edit yeah. these episodes. I know I do more. I don't know where you're going because there's going to be a lot of dead space here. Dead air, I should say. Um, did we uh, Wait, before we got to the schoolyard, did we cover the uh, the graveyard yet? Because I think that happens first. Where he sees the tomb and then uh, is told that it's flooded. Because he does go back to that later. I thought that was after the school when he asks the other girl that looks like um, Sister Rose. Yes, you're right. It's directions. immediately after. Okay, so we're at the, the schoolhouse, which he enters. And it's um, Sister Rose is the school teacher. The other one's Sister Thorne. Yeah. Um, so he interrupts uh, a daily class again. What sort of lesson is this? Uh, he walks in, yeah. and Sister Rose is asking the girls, what does a male represent? And two twin blonde girls raise their hands in unison and answer, phallic symbol, phallic symbol. Yep. Again, the entire class, little blonde girls with pigtails. Except there's also um, a quote above the board. I forget what it is, but... Uh, it's an old Gaelic line, basically translates to something about, like, something about the king is the only one without a sting or something like that. But then there's a William Blake quote written on the uh, on the board, too, that's very similar. But he, uh, he's questioning the girls. I don't remember if he clears the board first. But just basically- Well, the first thing that happens is Sister Rose turns around. She's like, don't stand there and scare my girls like that. <laughs> Yeah, Nicolas Cage's mere presence is pretty terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> but again, the whole thing is just him there trying to question uh, the teacher and the girls about if anybody recognizes Willow. Not Willow, um, Rowan. Rowan Woodward. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and nobody comes forward saying that they've seen him. He asks. Her. He stops and he asks. He's like, pass this picture around. Pass this picture around. Then he spots an empty desk. Yeah. And he's like, whose desk is that? And rather than just saying something like, it's a vacant desk. Yeah. Because, you know, classrooms don't always have the same number of desks as students. The teacher just gets flustered as, I don't know. <laughs> like, m- the most suspicious way possible. <laughs> and what's in that desk, Ben? A crow. He opens Why? the desk and a crow flies out. First of all, <laughs> first of all. How is there a crow in that desk that at no point prior to that even attempted to escape or make a noise? And, and that like that was planned, right? So they must have just assumed he was going to show up there in time to free the crow. But again, you would th- how well trained is this crow that they're like, okay, when this is closed, we don't make a single sound. Don't try to rattle the desk to get out nothing. Like you just go to sleep. Go to sleep, man. Just go to sleep. I love how he just freaks out at the children. And he that. asks, like, why is that in there? And like, oh, we put it in and want to see how long it could survive. Yep. And he's like, why the hell would you do that? <laughs> no answer. Has- no answer. And in typical in typical policeman fashion, he doesn't get an answer and just moves on. He just yep. accepts it. Like, oh, all right. I do love how at one point he just walks up to the, the blackboard, the chalkboard, and just erases the entire, like, all the info off. Yeah, half of it. He's pretty sloppy. Well, the like, middle of yeah. it. Completely just... Just to write down Rowan, Rowan Woodward. Yep. 
the most obvious name that he could have just said, he had to write it on the chalkboard like a jerk. Yeah, he already said it. Photo's been passed around. They've all denied her existence. Then he goes through... Um, he calls out the teacher for lying. Well, and he says that he's had enough of the lies. And this is what angers him. It, 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 it instigates him to start actually rooting through stuff. Yeah, going through the, the Before ledger. that, he was trying to get information. But as he's getting more and more aggravated by these cryptic answers and non-responses, he decides to forget it. Forget it. I'm just going to start... Breaking the law. Breaking the law and searching <laughs> through everything. Opens the attendance book, and a few pages back, it says Rowan Woodward, and it's just crossed out. Yep. Why Why would you keep records on that island like that? Yeah. Why would you? You've got, like, nine kids. It's pointless. Presumably, even if, like, oh, one so, of the kids doesn't come to school one day because they're sick or ill... You're going to know. Everyone's going to know. Like at the end it's a small year. fucking community. You're not going to need to go back at the end of the year and be like, how many absences does this kid have? We're going to fail them. Like, it's not that kind of school. No. They're not fucking, they're not learning anything. No. Well, no, we, we don't, don't know. Phallus symbol, phallus symbol. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. How is that educational? So, so the only, the only reason I can think that this, this le- attendance record list exists is it's a plant. Everything is a plant. But everything is a plant, yes. But it only works if he hits every single beat. There is the possibility that they had more plants than he actually hit. Can you imagine? But they just just, covered their bases. He's just that bad. He's only hit like three of the 15 they've planted for him so far. Because he's a shitty police officer. Evidently. So, at this point, Sister Rose is like, hey, hey. All right, not in front of the children. Let's go talk outside. Yeah. And this is maybe the most telling conversation that he has up until now. Because the the teacher essentially says she doesn't exist anymore and Willow is grieving. Right? And when he asks, how did she die? Sister Rose says, she'll burn to death. I loved that part, though. And he's like, what did you say? I said exactly what I meant to say. She, she will bur- She burned to death. Yep, yeah, changes the tense. And again, what does he do? Just moves on. Just moves on. Just moves lets on. Let's it go. Just completely lets it go. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why? Well, that is the most weird telling thing you could have had in this movie. And you're just like... Yeah, don't need to follow up on that. No. But he... he, Not that he follows up on it. He does question, like, what happened to the body and, and, you know, finds out that it would have been buried in the graveyard. Yeah, but the last part of what she said was, she'll burn to death. Yeah. What did you say? She burned to death. But specifically before that said, I said what I meant to say, which is also a weird statement in and of itself like is this scripted well the weird thing about it too is that it makes it feel like nicholas cage's character is inconsequential to the actual movie to the enjoyment of the film and it's more so we're trying to figure out the mystery not we're trying to watch him figure out the mystery because he's just a bumbling idiot <laughs> no comment no comment um so Edward uh, leaves, he goes to, uh, he's just walking down a trail, discovers a group of people working, um, asks if anybody there is aware of a a churchyard anywhere in the area. It makes sense, right? If he thinks that, well, they're claiming she's dead, well, now I'll go look for, like, a graveyard, which is probably attached to a church. Exactly. And a woman turns around and tells him where it is, and he's like, didn't I just talk to you? Because, again, this is Molly Parker playing a different character. She's like, no. She's beautiful. She could play as in many characters in the movie. Yeah, she's great. And she's great in like both roles. Uh, uh, Sister Rose and this is Sister, Sister Thorne. Thorne has one scene. That's fine. Okay. She's yeah, great. Whatever. I guess you don't even see her at the end because they're not going to shell out those CG effects. Nope. Um, points him in the direction of uh, the churchyard where he goes and he finds the grave. Um, not even really buried at all. It just a mound of dirt. 
Yeah. It's not even like somebody tried to, like, level it to the ground. It's like when you play a video game and you need to, like, find an item in the dirt. Or, like, those old cartoons <laughs> where, like, a part of the scenery is a different color so you know it's going to be interacted with. It's just, they might as well have put a giant sign that said, look here, man. <laughs> but while he's looking at this grave, um, Willow just shows up by chance. Probably wanted to finish a sentence she had started the day before. Yes. Uh, oh, I remembered. <laughs> <laughs> just lays out the entire rest of the plot of the movie. You should probably go. It's not going to turn out well for you here. But uh, through their conversation, she leads him to the ruins of the church where uh, she tells him about an old tomb and shows him the entrance to it. But it's been unused for years and years because it flooded a long time ago. Also, I find it really weird that there's a church on this island. Well, there's not really a church anymore. No, it's, like the it's just the of ruins church, of a yeah. church, I guess. Like, this is not a very... Well, it's not a Christian society. So I'm kind of wondering if they, like, destroyed the church when they settled it years ago. But there's it's it's just very strange for this church to even have been on the island. It does have one great shot. We were talking about it when we were watching the movie. They do a camera angle from, like, what would have been, like, the... I guess, like, one of the front or back walls of the church. Yeah. And it has, like, the window with, like, some sort of, you know frame to yep. it. Yep, the old cross frame. And then the camera pans to show that, like, that's, like, the only wall still standing, and the rest is just, like, crumbled pillars and stuff. And it just, it's just, it's nice camera work. Well, from that point... He does also point out that the entrance to the tomb... Is locked. Has a fresh lock. Yeah, brand new padlock. Um, which, honestly, is pretty easy to break. It's a flimsy lock. But, doesn't matter. Uh, he then asks to go see Willow's bedroom. Not Willow, uh, um, Rowan. Rowan's uh, bedroom. How is this? Well, he doesn't ask to see the bedroom necessarily. He says, where's the last place you saw her? It's like, how is this not, like, the first thing as a police officer you would have done? It's, where's the last place you saw her? Let's go to the scene of the crime. Yep. Yeah. From, Take it from there. From there. Um, no, no, in the bedroom. Oh, I forget what he finds. In the, uh, is it under the desk? Under the... Oh, jeez, man. Do you remember any of this movie? No. Jesus. This might be always like to review a movie with me. Yeah, pretty close. So they're investigating the room, and it is minimalistic to a fault. Like, there's a bed, a desk. There's, like, nothing. He looks under the desk, and there's a whole bunch of pen scribbles. They say things like, help me. There is almost like a beast kind of drawing, and it's all just like a cry for help, essentially. <laughs> I'm trying to get back to where as I skip the scene at the dock. Pardon? Because uh, after the, uh, he looks at the window from the bedroom and thinks he sees her, sees the kid on the, the docks. When was this? Right after the bedroom. He's in the bedroom with Willow and looks out the window, and he can see the dock in the distance, and he thinks he sees the kid on the dock. So he books it out of the house, down onto the dock, looking... What? This scene is so ridiculous, because he sees the plane landing, right? Mm -hmm. The daily delivery plane. And that's kind of what draws his attention to the dock, where he thinks he sees the girl. And in the amount of time it takes him to run there, the pilot goes missing and the radio is sabotaged. How long did it take you to run down there? But the, the plane's already, like, it, it's not even at the dock anymore. It's just floating in the water. It's just floating out in the water. But, like, he just sits down and holds his cell phone up trying to get service. Because there's no service on the island. No service. And then what does he, like, fall asleep? Yeah, he just waits. He just waits. Well, I, I guess I guess the idea is that he saw the plane and he says something, like, to Willow, like, oh, I gotta use the radio or something like that. Because the plane would have a radio. And maybe in his mind, he doesn't see the pilot when he first gets down there because he's doing deliveries. And he's like, well, what? maybe I'll just wait for the pilot to finish and come back. Yeah. And I guess he dozes off. Kind of, yeah. Because it doesn't show us that he fell asleep. But when he's sitting on the dock, he sees... He looks down through a grate on the in the dock and sees... Rowan floating dead in the water. Yeah. And decides that he's going to dive in and go after her. Which is the greatest dive ever. 
It is like a sideways twisting he, he, dive. Like he rips off his suit jacket, throws his gun down, runs toward the end of the dock, and then jumps and does this like three quarter twist in the air before mm-hmm. he hits. Well, because he has to turn around as quickly as he can. Yeah. Right? Because he tried to open that grate, but it's not going to budge. Question for you. Yeah, what's up? Why run to the end of the dock? Why not jump off the side? Well, maybe it's not as deep there, and he's got to do a dive rather than just walking into just, it. Just jump off the side. You don't have to dive. Just jump. Well, maybe the uh, maybe the sides did enough room for him to do the quarter turn. <laughs> it's just, it makes no sense. No. But I guess it's, it's a dream. So it doesn't have to make up. sense. He wakes up. It is a... It was a, a terrifying scene, and he wakes up, and he's all relieved, and then the camera pans down, and the dead girl is in his hands! So he wakes up again. So he wakes up again, and like, a dream and a dream, come on! <laughs> and at this point, it feels like it's been a long time, like he's been asleep for a while. So the best thing to do is take more medication. Well, now he swims to the plane, right? Yep. He goes and looks, and the radio is completely destroyed. And the pilot is still nowhere to be seen. At which time, he decides that he's going to go to... I don't know if he decides to go to the, like, the doctor, nurse's office. Maybe that's just like... He's walking back from the pier, essentially. Yeah. Dry again. His hair is a little wet, but like the clothes that he was wearing is perfectly dry. He's put his suit jacket back on. Makes sense that that would be dry. Yeah. But his other clothes is dry. And I don't know if he was intending to go to the, like, medical office, but he sees, like... Just a cottage of sorts. Well, it's kind of like one of those symbols with, like, the snakes uh, that you would like see. Apothecary. Like, apothecary. Yeah, like, it, this must be a medical facility. And he goes to, like, talk to the doctor. Dr. Moss. Because they tell him, like, this is the person that also takes the photos for the festival. And he goes there. I guess he does have the intention to talk to her, but I don't know if he intended to go there at this time. No, I think it just he just happened past it. He just happened past it and thought, you know what, okay, this is a good opportunity to go ask for a copy of that photo. Yeah. Right? And he meets the doctor. The great Francis Conroy. I know her a lot from, like, American Horror Story. She's in every season. Different characters, but yeah, it's something moving on. I don't, I don't really watch American Horror Story. But, like every other conversation, I hate to... I don't want to just belabor the point, but, like, every conversation is just weird. Yeah. And the problem is that most of them don't actually give you any new or insightful information. They're just weird and ultimately boil down to nothing. It Honestly, though, like, every encounter he has with somebody should make him more cautious. But he doesn't. It's not. like He ignores every red flag. And this, this facility that he goes to, not this time, but when he comes back... Some of the biggest red flags. Well, when he goes to see her the first time, he sees this massive open book and she like closes it. It's like a book of rituals. I'm like, Don't oh. question that. Nope. And he asks her, do you have a copy? She says she has the negative and she can get him another one. So he thanks her for his time and leaves and goes and hides in the most wor- like. Poorest hidden spot. It's direct line of sight. Direct line if you of leave sight the from front. the door. And he doesn't even have like a branch in his path. He is in an open part of the forest. <laughs> just sitting there with his big goofy Nicolas Cage smile. Waiting for the doctor to leave. With what looks like the Star Wars Royal Guards. <laughs> I like those beekeeper outfits though. They could have just been more normalized beekeeper hats. But, like, they literally went with, like, red hooded, like, almost like, like, like a sub, like an old submarine scuba diver's helmet. Yeah, it like looks like the old deep sea Circled diving. in the front with the beekeeper stuff. And he sees them escorting the doctor out of there and decides to go pick the lock with the most straight piece of metal. Makes no sense that you could pick a lock with it. Whatever. I didn't even... These houses don't even look like they're (laughs) advanced enough to have actual, like, modern-day locks on them. You probably just open the door. So he goes in to investigate now. He's going to find clues himself. Oh, he finds fucking clues, but he doesn't realize the clues. There are fetuses in jars. Oh, before he even gets there, he finds a bunch of uh, sheets, almost like pages removed from old texts. Uh, um, old etchings 
of like ritualistic sacrifices and burnings. And he's just flipping through and the look in his face is like, huh, hmm, huh. And then puts them down, leaves into like the, the back room of the house that you're talking about. But yeah, there's everything that's just preserved in jars, fetuses, everything like. There is no medical reason for there to be fetuses in jars in this facility. Yep. And he does not bat an eyelash. Like, dude, get off that island. Yep. So anyway, in a drawer, he finds backup copies of the photos. And sure enough, there's one of Rowan. Yep. I don't know if I can keep going. <laughs> so he just... I don't know if I can keep going. So he just leaves. There's other things he should be, like, terrified about that he's already picked up in his hands and looked at. But he's like, ah, the picture. They're lying. Yeah, man. Yeah, like, we got we that. We got that. He should have gotten that when he got to the island. So he goes and meets up with Willow for yet another argument where this Here. time she just – she straight up looks confused. Yeah, and then this is where she says, our daughter. And he finally figures out what the audience has known since the letter first arrived. Rowan is his daughter. What a twist. You're the stupidest cop on the face of the planet, dude. Do you remember what happens after – their, like, pseudo makeup. The, the, the kisses or something? Yeah, they kiss, and then he just leaves with his trusty bicycle. No, I remember what happens next. My brain says, F this, and walks out my ear. <laughs> he should have been crushed under the logs in this scene. But see, this is the part that I find, uh, like, ridiculous. He sees two men now. Yep. And they're loading sticks onto a truck. Don't speak. Or whatever, anything. Yeah, they don't answer any of his questions. He helps the guy put one more stick on the truck and then pulls the guy out of the way as the entire pile falls on him and then rides away. Yep. It's like, Dude, you made it worse and yeah. you're not even helping. Hey, yeah. can I help you? Oh, he shit. Fucks this got worse. No, I'm not. No, you don't need yeah. my help anymore. I'm out of here. Basically just throws the guy out of the way of the falling lumber on the bicycle and just Pedals away. So like, you wanted to help me. Why don't you help me now that all the sticks are on the ground, you jerk? And what happens when he gets on the bicycle? Where does he go? To the bee field. Because that's where you go if you're allergic to bees. And so he... Well, I mean, you can understand. All right. He's riding the, the bicycle. Maybe he doesn't know the lay of the land that well. Even though it's not implied that it's the biggest place. You could accidentally stumble upon a bee field. It's understandable yeah, that their hit, biggest export one is hive, hive, for sure. They would have that. The issue is, and I think they even show, like, he's not really looking where he's riding, and he kind of bumps into a beehive. Yeah. The problem is that his reaction, instead of running back the way he knows is safe, he's running, is to run deeper into right the beehive. In, right into it. He runs right into the, like, the farm itself. Maybe this isn't an allergy he just developed the week prior, <laughs> so he doesn't know how to not be a moron about it. I don't have an allergy to bee stings that I'm aware of. If I drove my bicycle into a beehive and then was like, oh, my God, bees, I don't want to get stung. Don't run towards them. Just don't. Well, technically, he's running away from the beehive he bumped into. Well, he runs past it, though, is what I'm saying. <laughs> like, he actively gets closer to it. And at this point, he gets stung a bunch of times. Well, there's hives everywhere, obviously, in a honeycomb dead? pattern. How is he not dead? I don't know. You see, you do see, it's very subtle, but as he's falling to the ground, you do see him reaching for his EpiPen. Yeah. You know what else you see when he's falling to the ground? A girl in a red sweater blonde pigtails with her back to him that gets run over by a truck <laughs> and then he passes out Get, why do you have to throw that in there again how many times it doesn't matter the, the whole scene just doesn't matter and like the whole point of this is to bring him back to uh, Dr. Moss because that's where he wakes up the person he's wanted to talk to the entire time yeah is um, Sister Summer's Isle, who we've not even heard of, by, or we've heard reference to by name, and that's it. This this but, scene this scene bothers me because he asks the doctor if she used his epipen, and she says no, 
I use the old methods. What, what is that? What are the old what methods? What is the old method? And again, doesn't question it. No, and he looks down at his arms. His arms are fucked up. If they're, those are big those are, bee stings. Yeah. But again, doesn't question it. Like, use the old methods. How am I not dead? Sounds good to me. Let's and, not question this any further. <laughs> nope. He wants to talk to Sister Summer's Isle now. Yeah. And I think it's Dr. Moss that tells her, like, She's ready to see you now. So, yeah. Been here for days, tearing up your town, and you're now ready to see me? All right. So he meets Sister Summer Isle. Played by Ellen Burstyn. Doing a great role, but a complete disservice to the original character from the first movie. So they decide to have a bit of a walk and talk. Through, through bees! bees. <laughs> like, More! And his only reaction is to, like, pop up his collar and wrap his neck. Even though he has so much skin exposed. Like, dude, you just got saved from these bee stings. He, well, they keep landing on him. And he's like, ah, slap in the back of his neck. And be like, go inside. <laughs> Have this conversation. You just left the house. Just be like, I'm sorry. Like, I almost died. Do you mind if we talk inside? No. No. We For can't my talk. safety, you please. Know, you talk out here. But no. And their back and forth is basically her... Shitting on society. Yeah. I think the entire purpose was he wanted to ask if he could dig up Rowan's grave. Yeah. But they go on this, like, walking journey and talk for, like, five minutes of movie time saying nothing. She's talking about, like, the god that runs their island. No red flags with him again. No. Like, she's talking about, like, essentially cult activity. And he's just like... Yeah, so can I look in that grave or what? Yeah, okay, now, pausing here, and let's just look at what he's encountered since he's been on the island. Oh, God, okay. Had the bribe guy to take him because they don't want visitors. Correct. Gets there. Encounters the weird three women and the two creepy dudes with the moving sack. Yeah. They're super standoffish. He's sarcastic. Strange. Goes to the tavern. Super aggressive. Talks to... Teacher, super aggressive. Other townsfolk want nothing to do with them. Unburied, or like, un, non, non-buried grave. So it's just an open grave. Flooded tomb. Having visions. Pilot goes missing. Gets almost stung to death. You missed the hospital with the jars of the fetus. The fetus, fetus jars, yep. Uh, almost stung to death. Brought back through the old methods. Have has already seen photos of people or uh, etchings of people being burned up the stake. Uh, understands that the doctor reads a book of rituals. Uh, they're super stoked about bees. Um, nobody wants to talk about this missing girl. Uh, this uh, sister Summer's Isle is just giving him nothing to work with. Like you said, obviously the leader of a cult, and he's like. I think something's going on here. That's it. I can tell you're uh, you're with me on this. This is the stupidest cough. <laughs> He's so dumb. But eventually... Let's get through this movie. I can't... <laughs> All right. Well, he leaves again on his bicycle after talking with Summer's Isle and digs up the grave. And what does he find in the grave, Sandro? A doll with a burned face. But how did it get burned? <laughs> I don't know. The quotable lines in this. So he finds the doll. Okay, I'm going to I'm gonna try and go a little bit faster. Go faster. Finds the doll. Hears a sound from the, the, the tomb, the flooded tomb. Yep. Sees that it's open. Climbs down there. Is there, is it implied that there's no other paths? Just the one that he, like a latch door? Yep. Uh, he sees a sweater under the latch door. Dives in. But it's because he finds that the, uh, the lock is open. The lock is open. Yep. Uh, this is what I meant. Is there supposed to be multiple paths in this catacomb, or is it literally the stairs down to this latch door that's flooded? It should just be the latch door down the stairs. So, how is somebody making noise from in the tomb and got out past him without him seeing them? No idea. Okay. So, he dives into the water to look for her. Whoever it was, I guess, teleported behind him, Nightcrawler style. Bamf. Yeah, bamf. And then closes the door and moves like a log onto it. 
luckily the door has like a hollow grate uh, window on the top of it. So he can tread water the entire night screaming for help until Willow comes in the morning. I assume in the morning? Yeah, it's in the morning. I assume in the morning to let him out. She sniffs the sweater from the daughter that's been in the like mossy water for how long. And he walks out perfectly fine. Doesn't collapse or anything from treading water the entire night. He is his complete strength. And yells at her, like, how did the doll get burned? I can't, I forget. I like, how did it burn? How did it burn? (laughs) I don't remember exactly. So anyway, he tells her some shit is going down. Go back to your place. Hide, blah, blah, blah. Yep. And goes back to the tavern. Uh, Not yet. He runs to uh, Summer's Isle's house. Oh, right. He goes this inside. You see the really weird, pointless I, uh, imagery. Yeah. It was, he was, opens one door. There's an old guy with a whole bunch of bee stings sitting in a bed. Old naked man in a bed covered in bee stings. And the look in his face is like, please close the door. Yeah. So he doesn't question that. Opens another door. There's a naked woman covered in bees sitting in a chair. Just grinning stupidly at him. Close that door. Close that door. Don't even question it. No problem. He doesn't open the door, but the camera goes to, like, I guess the the one door in the hall he decided not to check, which is Summer Isle's door, and she's in this gallant-looking bed, got a few, like, guards around her type thing, talking about how plans are going and blah, 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 and he leaves. Yep. Having not found her, because he chose to not open the one door he didn't open. Yep. Now he goes to the tavern? Yeah, runs into Sister Rose. They have another pointless conversation as he's passing by. And then he goes to the tavern. That's when he sees the uh, the men just sitting he there. He doesn't have a conversation with Rose now. It's either Rose or Thorn, but he passes them, and she's like, what's going on? Wow. Well, yeah, it's pointless. It doesn't matter. Okay. But yeah, then he goes to the tavern, uh, yells at the, uh, the old men who don't respond to him because they're just sitting around the table. Well, none of, they never respond. They never respond. They look at him. And that's about it. Um, then he... Goes to the pier? Yes. Then he goes to the pier. And he finds the pilot who has been killed, essentially. His mouth is sewn shut. And his eyes, too, I believe. I didn't see if they were sewn, but they're clearly closed. Nicholas Cage, in a stroke of genius, tries to shake him away. <laughs> Did you catch that? Yeah. Like, he... like. He, like, hey, wake up, dude. Wake up. And at this point, if you see in the background, the plane is, like, um, sunk yeah. in the water. Like, you can just see, like, the tail fin sticking yeah. out at this point, And the pilot is dead. And he goes back to the tavern. Oh, I should say, before he goes to the pier, he, st- he goes to another house, goes inside, and there's a, a woman standing there with her daughters that have the, like, weird animal masks on. And he demands for them to remove the masks because I guess he's still looking for Rowan. That's when he goes to the pier after that. Then as he's like throwing up or something, you see three kids stand up or three people stand up with animal masks in the distance watching him. And then he runs back up to the tavern again and sees Sister Beach and somebody else talking about the preparations. Well, this is where they literally say like, did you take care of that business at the pier? <laughs> and it's implied that this old lady killed the pilot. Yeah. And at this point, Nicolas Cage has just had it. He slowly walks up to Sister Beach. <laughs> it probably takes 30 seconds. Yep. Doesn't say a word. And then just punches her lights out. Yep. Then he takes a few steps. And Sister Honey... Jumps him from behind. The only good Sister Honey scene. Leading to a bit of a fight that ends with the worst cinematic kick, (laughs) but looks so good because he boots her right into the wall of pictures. (laughs) Now, at this this point, Sister Beach had a bear costume out that was on the bar because I guess that's her costume where everybody else is wearing masks. Yeah. And Nicolas Cage takes the bear costume. Yep, you see him struggle to put now, it on. Now, did you, did you just say that he saw uh, Sister Rose? But was that when he held her at gunpoint to take her bike? I think it was, yeah. yeah I completely missed that. Yeah. 
he had an interaction with her. No, he told he, her to he take held her, her mask gunpoint. off, held her at gunpoint to steal her bike, and and then told her, keep your stupid mask. And that's when he went searching the town. And when he broke into the one house with the lady and her daughters wearing the mask, one of the kids is just hiding in the closet, and yep. when he opens the door, she, she falls, falls out. face like, first. She knew that he was going to investigate the town in that frantic matter, so they were like, oh, let's set up this... Prank on him. Remember what we got? Remember how we got him with the crow? Get in the closet. How long were you sitting in that closet waiting for him to hit that house? So anyway, okay. We get to the town walking in like this yeah, unison. They axe the uh, ceremonial cask of mead, which I think would be a complete waste, but I guess they're they're doing their best for they're the upcoming one harvest. Out, man. Yeah. Did they did they even specify who their god is? I don't remember. It doesn't really matter. I'm just curious. But yeah, now that they're... Billy B? No. <laughs> nice. They did have the little teddy bears for the honey. Did they? Yeah, on the table in the tavern. That's and he, weird. Yeah, he made a comment too. He's like, I thought this was That's, a store-bought. Yeah, it's yeah. very store-bought looking. Yeah. Those things are creepy. Yeah, they are. But uh, yeah, so the entire town now is... Ah! <laughs> ah! Oh my god. <laughs> when did you do that? When you were outside. All right, for anybody listening, after I said that about the store bought honey, the bears, Sandro just points. I thought he was pointing at my beer or my book of notes. And I'm staring at this little table, just not getting it. And right above my notes is a bear of honey. <laughs> I think this this explains why I had no attention to this film. My brain's just <laughs> fried over the last couple of days. All right, all right. Bear with me. We'll get through. Oh, shut up. No, I mean, don't <laughs> shut up. Keep talking because you're the one carrying today's episode. Let's keep okay. talking. So anyway, I'm just going to take shots of this honey. <laughs> there is a procession line of this essentially ritual walking through a field. Uh, Nicolas Cage wearing a bear outfit runs into the crowd, finds Willow... Pretty much asks her, like, didn't I tell you to stay away? And she says, I couldn't stay away. Whatever that means. Whatever that means, yeah. And they finally get to the end of this, like, march. And up on a hill, they unveil Rowan essentially strapped to a log, which is presumably going to be set on fire. Yeah. Nicolas Cage runs up, punches out the guard, and frees Rowan. Picking her up and running into the woods. Running into the woods. Which is one of the funniest shots in the movie. Because it looks like there's a Sasquatch just racing a child into the trees. Yeah. At this point, Rowan, and he's telling her, like, I'm going to help you. I'm going to save you. Don't worry. At this point, Rowan runs up ahead. Right? And they presumably come out of another side of the forest. Well, actually, before they run out, he randomly gets a phone call. His phone rings. Finally getting service. But there's no one on the other end. It just rings. (laughs) And he's like, hello, hello, help, please help. Yeah, he's only in a half bear suit at this point. And nobody's there. Nobody's there. My best guess is the hidden phone that they used earlier in the movie, somewhere on the island, they used to distract him so that Rowan could run up ahead. Yeah. And, well, the thing is... Because they clearly have a phone somewhere. I want to say spoiler, but if you haven't pieced it together at this point, yeah, it's you know your own fault. It's not a spoiler. As they're running, the the community are chasing them, but they're not really chasing them. They're more so just kind of following them at a jogging pace, so you know that they're not trying to catch them. You know this is all a plan, and like you said, yes, Rowan gets ahead of him, and he chases her to another opening. Where everybody who was just chasing him is already waiting. Yeah, they bamfed in front of him. Yeah. Don't know how. At which time, it's revealed that he was the sacrifice all along. But, what bothers me about this entire thing is that Sister Summer's Isle says to him, You came of your own free will. As if that was required for the ritual. There's a lot of this ritual that makes no Did fucking sense. Did he not sense. come of his own free will from the very start? Couldn't he have shown up on the island and they just sedated him until it was time for the ritual? No idea. 
No idea. Yeah, they Maybe. could have just dropped him. Let's finish. Let's finish. The let's movie. not let's like. Let's just. Let's, finish, let's fuck with him first. The movie. He draws his gun on the crowd that's slowly approaching him. Yep. At which time Willow reveals that she had taken the bullets out of the gun. When wow. did she do this? I don't when know. Did, when did she do this? Because it's not like he has his gun on him all the time. He has it on him the whole time. The whole time. The only time she might have taken it off is if he had removed it before he dove into the water in the crypt and before she let him out. Potentially. Potentially. But the thing is, he wields that gun between then and now. You're telling me you wouldn't have noticed that all of the bullets were missing in the chamber when he held the gun up to uh, Sister Rose and stole her bike? Anybody? He's a trained police I'm officer. Saying, He'd be able to tell the weight of exactly. an empty gun anybody, versus a fully loaded gun. Anybody who has any experience with firearms would be able to tell when a gun is empty. So anyway, the crowd slowly approaches him. He tries to shoot. Willow shows she does, that she took all the bullets out. They reveal that she's Sister Summer Isle's daughter. And they essentially take Nicolas Cage to the Wicker Man, burn him to death, having but, Rowan, of all people... Be the one to set him a fire. But before that, how do they get him to the Wicker Man? Okay, so this is only in the unrated version. The sound. We get the sound. We do get the sound. Okay, so we were watching the theatrical cut, which doesn't show it, but there is audio in the background over other images. They break his legs, which you can see in the unrated DVD, cover his head with some sort of basket. Yeah, a wicker bees. basket and just pour bees in. Which is obviously the meme that everybody knows from this movie. Then with his broken legs, they essentially carry him in a sack. Much like we saw at the beginning. Of the movie. To the Wicker Man. They pull him up. As he's being pulled up, you see there's other sacrificial, like a goat and some chickens and stuff like that. They get the kid, his daughter, that was not a a lie, to set it on fire. And the movie ends. Now so the head the, the head falls burnt like the the man the worker man burns to the point where like the structurally unsound and the head tumbles off in a ball of flame hitting the ground and just exploding. Now in the theatrical version, there is also a scene at the end, which is not in the unrated cut. Yes, it is a scene of two cameos. We have James Franco and Jason Jason Ritter. Yep. Who are supposedly celebrating passing the academy and becoming police officers. They're at a bar. And they see Sister Honey and Sister Willow. Willow looking so good. They clearly got rid of all the cracked out eyes. and Oh, yeah. Like fixed her scrag. Like, like, let's looks, make sure she doesn't look like a junkie for this scene. It literally made me think that it was a different actress at first. It I thought it was too. Minute, right? Um... Actually, we should also point out when he's approached by the crowd and he's wielding the gun before he finds out it's empty, there's a random shot of three people in the crowd who remove their masks and it's his fellow police officer and the woman in the car and the daughter that get hit by the truck. We'll talk about that after. Yes, we will. (laughs) So in the scene, James Franco and Jason Ritter, they see Sister Honey, they see Sister Willow. And this is where we see that Sister Honey was potentially practicing when she was talking to to um, Nicolas Cage's character, Edward. Yep. Because she says to essentially James Franco, like, what are you doing out of he- after this party? Yeah, where are you going after? And he yeah. says, I'm probably just going to go home. And she says, will you take me with you when you leave? End of movie. Okay. I've done almost the entire <laughs> movie. Why don't you talk about some of the details before we get to the numbers, and I'll regroup a little. Okay. Well, I do have a few questions here. So we see that at the end of the film, that the woman and her daughter in the car at the beginning were actually real. Yes. How did they survive that? How did they survive that? What's the point? See, the cop would have made sense to me. If it was just the, cop the police makes officer, sense. it's like, it's like, because okay. the cop has direct dealing with the letter. Yes. And it's, it's almost like, because when they're talking to Sister Summer's Isle in that standoff, yeah. she essentially says, you were destined to be a sacrifice. Clearly indicating, let's put the pieces, uh, supposedly put the pieces together. Willow was sent out to find somebody who would later yeah. come in and be the sacrifice. 
And it would make sense that if they're that dedicated to it, that they would have essentially like a spy Mm -hmm. that would then keep an eye on these people to make sure that they kind of follow through the channels. So the police officer being there makes sense to me. Great. That's a great twist. It also then gives you a reason as to how he got a letter that wasn't stamped. That And she could easily just say, yeah, it was delivered to the precinct. Nobody would question it. Yeah, and that's what it was. But the daughter and the lady... It makes no sense. They don't even need to be there. No. They don't. They they add nothing to the movie I, I, except pointless flashbacks. I find it hard to believe that Edward Malice is not the kind of person that without that tragedy, if he got a letter that said right at the beginning, hey, I'm sorry I left. Rowan is your daughter yeah. and she's gone missing. I hate to be, like, I hate to be the one, like, I hate to tell you this way. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but right. please, can you help me find our daughter? Without the accident, he would have gone to look for her. Yeah. Right? But I guess then you can't give the fans, the audience, the spoiler that it's the daughter 40 minutes into the movie. But almost everybody knows the ending of the original Wicker Man. I don't. Okay. Most people, when they hear of the Wicker Man, have heard about this. The movie's from 1973. It's almost a 50-year-old film. So, this whole time, anybody who knows that movie, we're just watching to get to the end of the film. We're, it, it's really disturbing that we're all just kind of waiting to watch Nicolas Cage die. They bore you to the point where you just don't care. My problem with the entire plot of the movie is that there's so many scenes that are just like, that wouldn't have made sense if that was their plan. No. What if he died in the catacombs when he was treading water all night? What if they opened it and he had drowned? What if a fairy sank at the beginning? What if the fairy... Well... (laughs) I'm just saying. Yes. But I mean, that's one of those things where it's like our plan can't... Have any fault whatsoever. Well, no. What I'm saying is our plan... Like, there's certain things that we can't plan for. Yeah. Like, an act of God or whatever you want to call it of a fairy sinking on his way there. Yeah. We can't control that. We can very much control not putting him in a flooded yeah. tomb where he could have potentially drowned. Like, they open that in the morning, and he had drowned, and it's like, well, there goes our sacrifice. Our, was, yeah, the, the, the was, only this, way- was the bleeding sack at the beginning somebody else that was supposed to be sacrificed that year? Hey, we got to cover our bases. Too they, tiny. They sent two. They sent two at the end of the movie. We sent both Willow and Honey to get James Franco and Jason Ritter Maybe there was multiple, but it's like, yeah, this one died to yeah. one of our other plans yeah. before us. So I would didn't throw that one out. Didn't make it to the pier. That's why we were carrying him out of the water. He could have died in the barn when he was yeah. hanging there over the tools. If the bee stings, the bee stings could have killed him in the field. If I mean, they should have. Yeah. He's that allergic, and he got stung that many times. These. Old methods wouldn't have been enough to save him. He yeah. could have drowned in that water. He also got stung repeatedly after the old methods. There is way too many factors in the movie that, if their plan is to sacrifice him, yeah. could have could gone have backfired even, so bad. I mean, right from the start, it's like, okay, obviously it wouldn't make sense for the movie, but he could have been like, not my problem. Yeah. And just didn't go. But, like, you brought up a great point earlier, too. Like, if... He, like, when he shows up on the island, just fucking knock him out and restrain him. Here's another question. Why did they kill the pilot? No idea. If everything that they did was meticulously planned to get him there to be sacrificed. Um, if he saw any posters about, uh, Edward being missing on the mainland. But the only person that knew he was heading up to so, Washington was the cop who was in on it, so. Well, we'll get into that, too, because if a police officer didn't return. Yeah. I'm assuming cops would go looking for him. Especially considering that it's not like they'd have to wonder where he went. He told the police officer, I'm going to Summer's Isle. But what I'm saying is, if that pilot was not in on it, how would he have gotten to the island? How would they have expected him to get to the island? Yeah. No, there's, there's no there's ferry no way. there. There's no boat. No. Nope. I joked about a rowboat, but a rowboat's not going to make it across the ocean. Even if it is only a some some many miles, it's like twelve miles or right? something, it's not going to make it, right? So clearly, like, so was their plan like, oh, we'll just get him to the coast, and if he can't get to the island, oh well. Like it makes you think, like, yeah. oh, this pilot is part of it. 
Well, here's a question too. Simply make the pilot a female and Wh- don't kill her. Why? You got a cop out there keeping an eye on him. You can't have a cop pretending to be a delivery pilot. Well, that's a question. Why are they only going after police officers? My best guess is that it's either police officers or somebody that has a tendency to want to save people. Yeah. Like, you know... Do the the right thing, uphold the law. At the end, James Franco could have said, I just got a job as a paramedic or as a fireman or something. And that would have been fine. I would have been okay with that. It just seems like way too much of a coincidence. Because, like, would they just be going to the bars trying to find people who are, like, who here is in, like... First response. That's sloppy or, writing, but yeah. I get what they're going for, is that we're looking for a certain type of person. Mm-hmm. But that also makes it really, like, because that entire scene with James Franco and Jason Ritter makes it seem like they're just going to have a one-night stand, get knocked up, and leave. Yeah. But apparently when Willow was there, she was there long enough for them to get engaged. Yep. I don't know. Why kill the pilot? There's no plan. There's no part of your plan that actually involves... Getting him to your damn island? What? What are you going to do? <laughs> that now the next guy you got to sacrifice the following year? There's no pilot. Yeah. You Maybe. think the company that the pilot works for? Yeah, they're not going to go look for him. Where's our plane? Where's the black box on this plane? Oh, it's drowned on this island? Maybe let's look for our pilot that should have been on this island doing it. No, no, that's fine. What do they do with the kids that aren't blonde? Well, there is a question. He asks at one point what they do essentially about, like, what if somebody has a boy? Yeah, and this is when they're walking through like the B field of death yeah, for it's Nicholas Cage. Obviously, like strong stock and whatnot. Yeah, and he just she just again gives him a vague answer that he doesn't raise. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know if I can do any more of this. Is this movie is just <laughs> there's like at the end when you get like the eureka moment, there's so many things that you're like, this could have gone terribly. Like this yeah. is one of the worst plans. That they could have had. Well, it's also one of the worst remakes and that has ever been. We're to believe that this island has been running as a society for decades, and they can't even come up with a competent plan that would have prevented him from dying before the sacrifice? Yeah. This is terrible. What's the theme of this movie? It's incredibly misogynistic. I, I don't know, man. Uh, but Okay, but it, it was written and directed by Neil Labute who did probably the second worst remake ever, and that's uh, the Death at a Funeral remake. Okay. But he wrote the screenplay based off of Anthony Schaefer's 1973 screenplay. There's almost no similarities. So I don't know how it's really based off of. They ruined everything. In the original film, it was just a pagan society, and they brought in Sergeant Howie, um, who was like a good Christian police officer. And it's because they needed a believer in Christ for their ritual. That makes sense. Could have been anybody, but again, it was somebody who was willing to do the right thing, look for this missing girl. And that's, uh, again... And that goes hand in hand. Like this theory of a a first responder, Yeah, you know, Christian beliefs is going to be good people that are going to want to do the right thing. Exactly. It makes a little bit more sense there. But when you bring religion into it, that's one thing. There's no religion in it. But that's why simply make the scene with James Franco, have him say a different type of yep, first responder, exactly. and you've covered your bases there. Guess the budget. We've talked about this. Do you remember it? Because you remember the entire movie. 40 million. Yes. And what did it make? 38. Point 0.8. Okay. Failure. Failure. You feel good about that? It didn't deserve 38. No, I agree. This movie <laughs> sucks. <laughs> um, the ratings, though, I, I fully agree with these. Uh, 3.7 out of 10 on IMDb. That's the best it gets. It's Rotten Tomatoes. The critics sitting at a solid 15%. Audience slightly better at 17. There is a good movie in here, but it's called The Wicker Man. It was made in 73. I think our friend Josh from Pixel Opinions, who watched the movie with us, said it the best when he said, this movie has a great premise. Yep. And then he stopped talking. (laughs) <laughs> very much like our, like, very much like Sister Willow. Very much like me. It sounds like he was gonna have another like a sentence, but he just stopped. He's like, "This movie has a great present," and then he just stared off into nowhere. Well, I mean, popular review. Like Robin Hardy directed the original film. They added his name to the credits for this movie, and he demanded them removed. Right? You can't blame him. Christopher Lee 
who played Lord Summer Isle, not Summer's Isle, Lord Summer Isle in the original, thought this movie was a piece of shit. They changed Summer Isle to Summer's Isle because they thought American audiences wouldn't be able to pronounce it properly. If I'm not mistaken, I looked in the trivia and they offered the part of Edward Malice to a few other actors. Oh, yeah, they're like, fuck now. And they all said, like, they all looked at the script and said, no. No, this is horrible. No. Cage insists that this movie is an absurdist dark comedy. No, it's not. No, it's not. No. It's just a shitty fucking movie. It's done so poorly. And they knew it. They knew that this was a bad movie because they didn't even screen it for critics before it was released because they didn't want the negative press to get out there before it released. Okay, man. I don't know how much more of this I can take. All right. Let's I go just, into the awards. Let's go awards. Ahead. I've complained about it enough. Let's go into the awards. So you would least start favorite? us off with like least favorite character. Sister Honey. Really? I don't like anybody in this movie except for one. I have to disagree with you. That's fine. She had the worst delivery. Now don't get of me anybody. wrong. Don't get me wrong. Everybody in this movie is bad. But remember, this is worst character, not performance necessarily. Yeah, she's my least favorite character. And for me, it's Sister Willow. And it is almost entirely because this character just starts sentences. But the character is pivotal for the plot. But I'm really sorry. <laughs> Seriously, though. I hate this character. I hate the character of Sister Willow. Oh, that's fine. You can, I you can hate her. all you want. It would have been better if, it, if, like, the character that just said things and trailed off was like a Sister Honey. There's no reason for Sister Willow to not just be a normal speaking, just distraught woman who lost her child. Okay, that's fine. Like, you can dislike the characteristics of her, for sure. And, like, the way the lines are delivered is pointless. It's least favorite character, and that's exactly why. I don't know why you would like Sister Honey more than that, though. What, well, what do you like about her? I wouldn't say I liked her. I would say I disliked her less. Okay. Such a pointless fucking character. There's a lot of pointless characters in this movie. Yes. But I find that they use her a fair amount when they don't need to because she adds absolutely nothing to any story element. She doesn't even need to be in the final scene. It could just be Willow again doing what she did before. Or any one of the or other. Or any one of them, there. yeah. I guess it's all interchangeable. But that's why. Like, I mean, maybe Lily Sobieski's performance wasn't great, but the character is fine. Like, no, she seemed the like, character was not fine. She was fine. like a willow in training. <sighs> fine. Sure, we'll go with that. You're allowed to have a differing opinion. It's not like... No, my... I know. I'm not saying that. I just... I, I fucking hate this character. I don't understand how you can be... I like... Willow, yeah, I didn't like the performance. I didn't dislike the character. Well, but I mean, that's part of the character. I, I, I don't know if the, like, the actress was like, you know how we should do this? Oh, guaranteed. Just me just trailing off like an idiot all the time. <laughs> Fine. That's the character they wrote. Do you want I'm, to go with favorite I'm, character? Though? I'm confident. Hold on, hold on. No, I'm confident. That I thought you didn't want to talk about this movie anymore. I'm confident <laughs> that any actor that they cast as Sister Willow would be doing those same mannerisms. Because I don't think that that was a performance choice. Yeah, no, this director is terrible. So yeah, he's obviously giving terrible direction to his actors. All right. So favorite performance yes. or character? Uh, I'd say the eighteen wheeler. Yeah. <laughs> for running over children. It's the most consistent in its plot. It's, that, that fucking truck is in the movie more than Sister Hunt. I, I buy that truck's performance. Like, when that truck is on screen, I'm like, yeah, that's a truck. That's a truck. Yeah, like, he played it. That's a fast what you don't know. Vehicle. What you don't know is that that's actually a boat playing a truck, but it's so good that it makes it believable. Well, just look at the acting it did on the ferry. Don't know many trucks that could do that. <laughs> Let alone get on that ferry. Yeah. So you're going with truck? I mean, that's kind of against our rules. I just wanted to be a goof about it. But yeah, apparently, well, this movie's a giant goof on us. Um, honestly, my favorite character is Sister Rose. Yeah, Sister Rose. Not when I'm watching the movie, but in retrospect, is perhaps the best acted one for like. Oh, I slipped up. I didn't mean to say That's she'll burn to death. It it probably helps that she had little screen time 
for actual prominent characters. Like, obviously, she had more screen time than cameos or background or, yeah. like, the pilot or anything like that. But for an actual prominent character, she had the least camera time, which maybe helps. But she was the only one, like, when he was interrogating in the school, at first I'm like, she is terribly hiding these secrets. But then you watch the movie and it's like, she's supposed to be. Yeah. And it's only in retrospect that you look at her character and are like, okay, that was done well. When you're, when I'm watching it, I'm like, this is terrible. Yep. Because I thought, like, oh, we're not supposed to be, but like, yeah, she's supposed to be telling. What about you? Edward Mouse. I can see that. I liked it because every time he was on screen, I'm like, how's he gonna fuck this scene up? <laughs> <laughs> how, like, how oblivious is he gonna be now? Like, what is he gonna miss? I had I was like I've seen this movie a couple of times and it's always a game I'm like what did I miss that he also missed <laughs> <laughs> I watched nothing like, no nope, you picked no up I got everything, everything yeah. and he missed it missed all of it it was entertaining like I don't know I do like Nick Cage but it, like that's not why I picked this character this character is just such a bumbling idiot it almost feels like an Inspector Clu- uh, Inspector Clouseau from the Pink Panther where like he's just stupid. But he's meant to But be he's stupid. meant to be. That's a parody. This is not. Yeah. I, I don't care what anybody what says. He can say what he wants. It's not. No, it's terrible. But uh, it's so entertaining. What did you have for your favorite or most memorable line? It's the bees. Whenever anybody mentions the Wicker Man remake, it's always the bees. No, not the bees. Even no, though he you only... forgot. He's also like, ah, oh, they're in my eyes. <laughs> yeah. They're in my eyes. Well, they might be in your mouth now because you won't stop shouting. Yeah. But we only hear it. We don't get to see him say it in the theatrical cut. Yeah. Um, I, it's not I, my favorite line. It's most see, memorable. It's hard to say if I'm disappointed we watched a theatrical cut because I didn't get to see the bees part. But I also, if we didn't watch it, we wouldn't have seen the scene at the end with the cameos and seeing Sister Honey and Willow going yeah. back out there. And that feels like it needs to be in the movie. Yeah. Um, Plus, without watching the director's cut, you didn't see his legs horribly broken. Yeah, so... I feel like you should get a mix of the two. Then. Yeah. Or, or just watch the unrated DVD and then pull up the extra scene on, like, YouTube. Yeah. The cool, Well, the thing with the um, the unrated one is they, they cut 12 minutes from the movie. And I think the director's cut only has four minutes – or has eight minutes added back in. So, there's still four minutes just floating around out there. I'm really curious what it was. They had to cut it to get it down from R to, like, PG-13 or whatever. Uh, your favorite line? Um, in the similar vein to the bees, but like watching the theatrical version, just having the audio without the video didn't hold up. But for me, it was like, how to get burned, how to get burned, <laughs> how to get burned, how to get burned. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> and he's like yelling, but like, give her a chance to answer. Even if she has the answer, you wouldn't have gotten it because you didn't shut up. I just love to like the whole time he's shaking the doll in her face. Yeah. She's like, yeah, I can see it's burned, man. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> calm. Calm. Okay. Fave scene? There's no question about this. Watching Yogi Bear run up the freaking hill and knock out a girl. I have the same one. I guess I have to say this because this is the world we live in. I'm not endorsing violence against women, but if you can't watch a scene of Nicolas Cage in a bear costume, just run up a hill and punch an unassuming woman in the face... You don't know comedy. It's not even that, man. What it is, like, there's almost no music at this scene. He's running uphill, and it's a laborious run. <laughs> and this is the and most out-of-shape cop ever. The woman at the top with Rowan is just standing there. And, like, the way he's moving, you can pretty much hear him be like... <sighs> <sighs> he's just running at, like, a jogging pace, but he's giving it his all... And then gets to the top, and it looks like he's going to put his hands on his knees, just uh, taking a breath. And he throws the slug, most like slowest sluggish punch ever. It's just whomp, and she just drops. Everybody knows it's coming. Anybody who hasn't seen this movie before, they know exactly what's going to happen. And the woman's just standing there watching him, like, "What's this?" Even though she's in on the whole plan. But yeah, that I, I originally wanted to say the Wicker Man burning because it's. Such an iconic scene. But they even fucked that up compared to the original. Dude, I was debating between that and him punching Sister Beach or kicking Sister Honey into the wall. That kick into the wall a, is phenomenal. It was a ridiculous kick. Yeah, so. 
Okay. We're done talking about this movie, We're Sandra. Done about I mean, you're done talking about this movie. I didn't really say anything. You're welcome. All right. All right. Final recommendation. Don't watch it. Don't watch it. I have at it. Never watch have it. Have at it. Never watch it, it. If you want to see a train wreck of a movie, watch this. All right. I'm not even going to allow us to do any further final thoughts. Ben, what are we watching next week, man? Uh, the 2006 remake of The Wicker Man. No. No. All right. It's our fan pick for May. All right. Well, we only had two submissions, and I want to say the lesser movie won. But Ryan submitted 1995's Evolver, and that's what we're going with next week. Place your bets. Place your bets. Now accepting wages for Kyle Baxter. Virtual reality god. Shoot! Evolver defeated. Kyle Baxter, you are the winner of the Evolver Home Contest. You did! Wow. It looks like you won. Hello, I am Evolver. Need another player or something. Okay. This is too intense. Evolver ready to play. Each time Evolver is defeated, he evolves up to the next level. <laughs> Bullseye. <laughs> Evolver hates to lose. Infiltrate. Attack. Need more power. Where he gets smarter, quicker, and harder to beat now. Hey, Evolver. What sword? Strategic war oriented robotic device. This thing is destroying my house. Interesting design glitch. Advancing to next level. I think there's something wrong with the evolver. Let's play! This toy acts like it's playing for keeps. I don't think you get how dangerous this thing could be. Come on. Kyle, we cannot beat this thing. Need more power. Allie! I think it wants to kill you. All right, until then, have a good one. How to get burned?